All right. Welcome to the uh, final installment here of uh, the series on Moses and the Exodus. And uh, we have been spending our time on the life of Moses from the time he was born, but uh, really most of our time has been spent on his last 40 years, the years that he spent leading Israel from Egypt all the way to the threshold of the promised land opposite Jericho. Um, it, this was all done in four stages. Uh, we have three of them mapped on this, uh, this picture. Uh, the first one was uh, from Egypt to the, through the desert of Sin. Uh, that doesn't mean sin in terms of transgression, but that's just the name of it. Um, through the Red Sea and up to Mount Sinai. And that's where they stayed for a year. We've been spending some time on that. Then there's the short journey from Mount Sinai up to Kadesh, sometimes called Kadesh Barnea, which is right on the edge of the promised line, land. And then uh, that's where they had the crisis of unbelief and the refusal, what I call the great refusal. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. The rebellion right on the edge of the promised land. And then there was 38 years of wandering south of Kadesh all the way down to Elat. Elat is down here on the uh, Gulf of Aqaba. So somewhere between those two, and we know almost nothing about that. And then there's lastly, what we're going to deal with today is the transit from Kadesh around Edom and around Moab and Ammon up the eastern side of the Jordan River and the campaigns against the Amorite kings uh, that were there. So that's, that's where we're headed. Let's see. Okay, the book of Exodus stops with the consecration of the tabernacle, which occurs at Mount Sinai. And then the narrative shifts to Numbers. Numbers is called Numbers because there are two censuses that are taken of the people. And also you'll find there's a recap of that at the very beginning of the book of Deuteronomy. So we'll draw from both of those in our story today. Uh, numbers, however, is, is odd because the story, uh, the historical event story, is mixed up with other smaller passages that deal with law, religion, customs, and they don't advance the historical narrative at all. So what I've done is for you, I've provided uh, just an, an outline of the headings of, um, of numbers. And what I do in my Bible is I'll take the last verse in one of those sections and put the reference of the next one. So that way, uh, if you're trying to follow what happens, uh, you see the census in chapter one by verse three, you're going to jump to nine. In chapter nine, verse one, you get the journey to Kadesh and so forth. So you might want to do that. And the nice thing about that is that keeps you from getting bogged down in things like uh, the inheritance of Zelophehad's daughters. So that may just interrupt your, your thinking. Um, so we left the story at what I call the great refusal. And that would be down here at Kadesh. If you look at your slides at Kadesh Barnea down to the south, that's where they were. And uh, you remember there was a riotous and rebellious um, rejection of Moses' leadership. In fact, it really was a coup where he was removed from the leadership and new leaders were actually placed in provisional control. I'll tell you why I think that's so. Uh, but as, as part of that, God interrupted the, the riot so that Moses was not stoned to death. And then Moses went into the tent of meeting and he spoke and God gave him the judgment, which is pronounced eloquently in the 14th chapter of Numbers. And he, uh, he tells them that they are now condemned because of their unbelief and their contempt for the Lord to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And every one of those 20 years older, old and older, except Joshua and Caleb, would die in the desert, and their bodies would rot there. That's a pretty severe judgment. Um, however, uh, let's see what happened right after that. Numbers 14, uh, and you might want to follow along. We're going to go from Numbers 14, jump to 16, and we'll be on 16 and following, and also jumping to Deuteronomy 2. So if you have your Bibles, you might want to have those marked. Okay, Numbers 14, 39 to 44. When Moses reported this to all the Israelites, they mourned bitterly. 
Early the next morning, they set out for the highest point in the hill country, saying, Now we are ready to go up to the land the Lord promised. Surely we have sinned. But Moses said, Why are you disobeying the Lord's command? This will not succeed. Do not go up, because the Lord is not with you. You will be defeated by your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites will, will face you there, because you have turned away from the Lord. He will not be with you, and you will fall by the sword. Nevertheless, in their pres presumption, they went up toward the highest point of the hill country, though neither Moses nor the Ark of the Lord, the Lord's Covenant, moved from the camp. Wait a minute. <laughs> what happened here? Where's Moses? Nobody's listening to him. That's why I say there was effectively a coup. These folks, his political enemies, may have been cowed by the appearance of God's glory at the tent of meeting, but they still had enough political strength to take the army away up to the central ridge as if they were going to conquer the land apart from the Lord. You look at your map here, they would have gone up this road, which is the central ridge road up uh, into Israel, and they would have gone to this central ridge because it says they went to assault the highest peaks. And so they would have been uh, assaulting these Canaanite kings up in this region. I want you to remember where that region is for later. A um, couple things to remember. First of all, they denied that the Lord's judgment had any force. And I think that's probably because Moses came out of the tent of meeting and it was Moses that conveyed to them the contents of chapter 14. He is the one who would have said, you're going to uh, wander in the wilderness for 40 years as judgment. And um, they would have said, how do we know that's true? I mean, after all, it's just this guy, Moses, has just come out here and tells us all this stuff. I think that's a lot of bunk. That's not true. We are God's people, and we can take the land with or without him. Remember, they had command of the army. And, and in any coup, the first thing you've got to get is command of the military forces. And it's probable, I think, that Moses and Aaron were even under some form of house arrest. So they marched up this central ridge to these cities, and they're going to take on the Canaanites by themselves, and they got their clock clean. Look at verse 45. It says, Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in the hill country came down and attacked them and beat them down all the way to Hormah. Now, Hormah is a word that means destruction, and I, it's right here where I'm pointing on the slide. So they beat them down, oh, about 25 miles. Must have been a lot of casualties and uh, a lot of chaos. And uh, I want you to remember Horma because it's important for later on, all right? So they ended up getting beat. And the story is interrupted at this point, and you jump then to chapter 16, okay? Now there's still a crisis of authority. Who is in charge? Who is the boss? It Kadesh. So let's read chapter 16, one to three. Korah, son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and certain Reubenites, Nathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, became insolent and rose up against Moses. With them were 250 Israelite men, well-known community leaders who had been appointed members of the council. They came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone far enough, too far. The whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? Okay. First of all, to give you an idea who Korah is, Korah is one of the sons of Kohath of the tribe of Levi. And if you were to go back into, into Exodus, you would see that the Levites and the Kohathites in, in particular were given a very special place in the ministry around the temple. They were the ones who actually carried all of the temple uh, equipment and the tent components and all of the sockets and the poles and everything like that. They carried that when they moved the tabernacle from one place to another. So they were very important in the tabernacle worship, but they weren't the priests and they weren't the people who offered incense. So they weren't at the center of power. And that figures into this. Now, I think Korah, Korah and two guys named Dathan and Abiram, they seem to be Moses' chief political rivals. 
And you got to remember, we're talking about a community of over a million and a half people, and there's an entire tribal governmental organization. They might have had elections. They might have had uh, all kinds of political activity we know nothing about. But these guys rose to the top. And it says that they were not alone, but rather they had 250 members, prominent leaders in the community, members of the council. What was the council? Well, the council, as you see it mentioned several times, seems to be something like Congress or the parliament or uh, in, in Iran, it's the majlis. It's the, it's the assemble of, assembly of leaders that makes the laws and makes the big decisions. And uh, it says that these guys, these 250, had been appointed to the council. And I, and I wonder if that means recently, uh, perhaps their core is men. Perhaps he's packed the council. We don't really know, but whether he's packed the council with his own guys or if perhaps he has just convinced people to follow him, uh, he's now got a critical mass of the council, possibly even a majority, that are challenging Moses and they are deposing him. They've already basically put him out of control of the army. Now, look at some of the arguments. First of all, he makes the argument that the, the whole community is holy and the Lord is with them. This is the exact same argument we saw when Aaron and Miriam challenged Moses' leadership back in chapter 12. Remember, they said, well, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he also spoken through us? What makes you so special? Who died and left you sheriff? You know, this is the, the notion that you're no better than we are. Now, God had answered that by giving uh, Miriam uh, leprosy for seven days. She was thrown outside the camp. And so they, they gave that up. But here it is again, the same argument. Now, he says, you have gone too far. And what does he mean by that? Well, I think he's referring to the severity of God's judgment that Moses had pronounced. He said, come on, Moses, we had a bad night, okay? We, we got upset, we, 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 we got angry and everything like that. Listen, we're back on track, man. Um, you, you've just gone too far pronouncing a 40 year exile for, no, we're gonna die in the desert. We're not gonna see this promised land we've been told about since we were way back in Egypt. Come on, I don't buy that. That's too severe. You've gone too far. I think they just don't like God's judgment on the people. He point out a couple things. First of all, they said, well, look, Moses, isn't the nation holy? I mean, didn't God say on the mountain that, that he wanted to enter this covenant so we would be a kingdom of priests? We are all priests here. And then they also appeal to democracy. He says, why do you set yourself above the Lord's assembly? Look, we got the votes. Who are you to, to deny the election, right? The council represents the people and the people are the Lord's people. So therefore God has spoken. Well, a lot of our church polity is done in democratic ways, but God's word is not democratic. God's authority is never given up. He never denies his own word. And when he has spoken, he has spoken. And remember he has spoken through Moses. He has settled on Moses as his leader. Well, Moses has to figure a way to deal with this. And so in verses four through six, he proposes a kind of face-off. And he says, okay, guys, you come on to the, to the tabernacle or maybe the tent of meeting, not sure which this means at this point, but, um, and we're going to have you all bring some incense and God will draw near to him the one whom he has chosen to be his priest. Now, of course, that would be Aaron. But um, the idea was, you all get in here, and God will reveal, and he'll draw near to him the one who's okay. Now, these Levites, they wanted more power. They wanted to act as priests themselves. And Moses reminds them their insurrection is against the word of the Lord. And he says in verse 6, you have gone too far. You have denied the word of God. And I think we should take a lesson from that. The word of God has been given to us. The Bible is his word. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. And when we depart from that, we take ourselves away from that. And we decide we're going to do things a little bit differently. We deny that it says what it says. Then we are going too far. So that's what Moses says. You Levites have gone too far. So, he calls them to this assembly, and two of the guys refuse to come. 
And by refusing, they, they, they spit back at Moses some accusations. Now, these are the accusations of rebels, of people who are rebellious and who have turned against him. And they are utterly incoherent. I just want you to read them. 16, 12 to 14, Alvin. Then Moses summoned Nathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. But they said, we will not come. Isn't it enough that you have brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? And now you also want the Lord to lord it over us? Moreover, you haven't brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey or given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Do you want to treat these men like slaves? No, we will not come. Now, consider these arguments. There's three of them. First of all, he says, you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey into the wilderness. Wait a minute. I thought that he had brought them up out of Egypt where they were slaves. They had forgotten about the whip. They had forgotten about the suffering. They'd forgotten about the poverty. They had forgotten about the oppression. Now, all of a sudden, Egypt looks like a land flowing with milk and honey. They have inverted this whole thing, and they have called good, bad, and bad good. And then secondly, they blame Moses for their failure. So that, first of all, they say, you took us out of a land flowing with milk and honey, and you promised us that we would have an inheritance of fields and vineyards in a land flowing with milk and honey, and you have not taken us to that land. Of course, we know that in just in the matter of the last few days, Moses had brought them to the brink of the land. The spies had said, two of them had said, we can take this land, and they were about to go in, and the people refused. It was the coup led by these guys that kept them from going into the land. Just the exact opposite of what they were saying. And then he says, you, you want to treat these people like slaves. I think that's pretty ironic for the guys that want to take these people back to Egypt where they will be slaves again. Anytime you see rebellion, you will see incoherent arguments. There is no wisdom in rebellion. The New Testament says the rebelliousness of man does not work the righteousness and the wisdom of God. We see it today even, for example. We're, uh, we're saying that our demonstration is against racism and we want to pull down Abe Lincoln's statue, the guy who, who freed the slaves. Uh, it is utterly incoherent when we become rebellious and we lose our sight of wisdom. What's the first thing that you do when you're on the outs with God? You stop going to church. You stop reading his word. We lose sight of his wisdom. Okay. So anyway, at this, Moses is pretty angry. Okay. And somehow we don't know what happens here. Um, he says in verse 15, Lord, don't accept their offering. I've not taken so much as a donkey from them, nor have I wronged any of them. And I'm not sure why he says this. But then he says again to Korah, all right, you and all your followers come up here before the Lord. And this time they do. Apparently, they all do come. He tells them, come to a meeting in front of the tent of meeting. Bring your incense and your censers. And uh, maybe he's, um, he's going to tell them, look, it, it, you can all go into the tent and you can act as priests. Or maybe that's what they think. I don't know. But in any case, they all come. And in verse 28, Moses declares that the fate of his enemies is the sign that the priesthood and his leadership of Israel were not his idea. Verse 28, he says, This is how you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things, and that it was not my idea. If these men die a natural death and suffer the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. And he goes on to, to uh, describe explicitly what will happen. But I think it's important that he says, look, this wasn't my idea. I'm not the guy who made this up so that I could be king. And we see that uh, God speaks through his word, and we can trust it, and we should obey it because it comes from him. We, we get that in the New Testament in 2 Peter 1, verses 20 to 21. Alvin? Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the in the human in the human will the prophets though human spoke from god as they were carried along by the holy spirit okay alvin uh we're getting uh, interrupted sound when you read 
and I don't know why, but it's getting a lot of static. If you can do anything to fix that, I'd appreciate it. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and pick up the, la the reading. Um, I'm sorry for that, everybody. Um, okay, so uh, no prophecy of scripture of any, is of any private interpretation, but men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so God's word is reliable. If God has truly spoken, then we can rest all of our arguments upon his word, knowing that his word is true. That's where you begin. But if the Bible is not God's word, then everything else is up for grabs. We're without any sure anchor for what we believe. And it's just another bowl session with somebody who has a different opinion. Uh, I remember when on my first cruise on a carrier, I stayed in a five man bunk room and you know, five young kids right out of college, brimming full of wisdom would have these bowl sessions and we would have them all. And so we would get to some question and I would always try to take and show them the passage of the Bible that I thought would, would bear on that thing. And that's why I took my position. Okay. And, uh, and they would laugh at that. Oh, you know, you again, you and your Bible and all that. I said, Hey, wait a minute. I got a source for what I believe. Now, that's God's word. And I can defend that idea. But if it says that there, that's why I believe it. What about you? Well, you know, I just don't feel that that's a good idea. I say, oh, I see. You're the reason. You're the source of your own truth. And we live with that all around us today. So men spoke from God. God's word is what it is. And um, it's not my idea, says Moses. Now, God's dramatic judgment then falls on these conspirators, their tents, their families, all their followers are swallowed up in a big sinkhole. And then a fire from the Lord, whatever that was, consumes all 250 of his followers and uh, in the council assembly. Uh, Alvin, oh, let's see, I'll go ahead and read 16. Uh, I'm sorry, we just, unless, have you got another mic or something? No, okay. No, I'm, this is the only thing I have. Okay, I'm sorry, Alvin. Uh, as soon as he finished saying all this, the ground under them split apart and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them and their households and all those associated with Korah together with their possessions. They went down alive into the realm of the dead with everything that they owned. The earth closed over them and they perished and were gone from the community. And at their cries, all the Israelites around them fled shouting, the earth is going to swallow us too. And then fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. It's an interesting sequel to that. I wasn't gonna cover it, but I'll mention it. Uh, all those censers with all was left, okay? These golden censers, and Moses told uh, the artisans to pull them, to hammer them out, and to uh, overlay the altar of incense with the gold from those censers. Um, so that every time they offered incense, they would remember that God had declared who was to do it and who was not. So, you know, the next thing Moses would say is, okay, any questions? <laughs> no, nah, I would think that would be enough, but it wasn't enough. It was not enough. The people were still in rebellion. Uh, look at 16 verse 41. He says, the next day, the whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. You have killed the Lord's people, they said. Well, no, the Lord had killed the Lord's people. I mean, Moses wasn't able to open the ground and swallow up anybody, and no fire came out of him. But they blamed Moses for it. And they said, Moses, you have killed the Lord's people. You have hurt those, those specially chosen people of God. In verse 45, though, God's had enough. And he says, Moses, he says, get away from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. And he's just saying, look, get out of the way. I'm going to destroy them all. And then uh, Moses falls on his face and he intercedes like he does time and time again. He is an amazing leader in his compassion for a rebellious and wicked people that over and over again takes him to the limit and takes the Lord to that point where he threatens to destroy them all and start over. So. Uh, apparently, at this point in time, God does not destroy them, but he sends in a plague that had some immediate effects. I don't know what those were, but uh, apparently people died immediately from this. And so Moses urgently sends Aaron into the mob. Uh, chapter 16, let's look at 47 to 49. He says, 
So Aaron did as Moses said and ran into the midst of the assembly. Oh, let me let me back up at that and say, and say with 46, okay? Uh, I should have said 46. So Moses says to Aaron, take your censer, put incense in it along with burning coals from the altar. Hurry to the assembly and make atonement for them. Wrath has come out from the Lord. The plague has started. So Aaron did as Moses said, and he ran into the midst of the assembly. So there's urgency here. The plague had already started among the people, but Aaron offered incense and made atonement for them. Now, here's something that's interesting. He stood between the living and the dead, and the plague stopped. But 14,700 people died from the plague, in addition to those who had died because of Korah. And then Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Now, Moses was very, very shrewd in telling Aaron, you take the censer, you put the incense in it, you go out into the assembly and get in the middle of the people and offer an atonement for them. And it turns out that Aaron's the one who's standing between the, the living and the dead. He's the one who protects the people from God's wrath. And that is exactly what a priest is supposed to do. The priesthood was there to take the people's case before the Lord God at the mercy seat. That is the right role for the priesthood. And it clearly points out that Aaron is God's anointed priest. And the deaths are limited to 15,000. Could have been a lot more. Now you'd say, okay, well, that, well, we have now solved the question. But it wasn't enough. It still wasn't enough. I want you to notice one thing before I, we go to the last one. These are all signs of power. God has the power to vaporize the earth and the solar system in a heartbeat. After all, he created them. God has the power to kill. He has the power to destroy. And he will use it at times. But that wasn't what would draw the people to him, at least not finally. So we go on to chapter 17. And that gives the account of the last testimony that God used to assert Moses and Aaron's authority. One staff from the leader of each tribe, and Aaron's staff would be for Levi, was placed inside the tabernacle in front of the Ark of the Covenant. In 17 verse 5, it says, The staff belonging to the man I choose will sprout, and I will rid myself of this constant grumbling against you by the Israelites. That's what God said. Oh, okay. So you're going to take all these staffs, all 12 of them, put them inside the tabernacle and walk out. So notice, Moses has his hands off. This isn't coming, this isn't Moses getting some word and then and coming out and telling the people. He's, he's off out of, out, of, out of the picture. Now all those rods are left there for one day. And in the next day, Aaron's rod had in fact sprouted. Not only that, it was more than that. It says in verse 8, you look at that. The next day Moses entered the tent and saw that Aaron's staff, which represented the tribe of Levi, had not only sprouted, but had budded, blossomed, and produced almonds. What do we see here? We see life. This was the sign of life. You know, uh, the sermon this morning in church talked about Jesus, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. God has power to destroy. He has complete control over his universe, but he also is the giver of life. And it is life that draws people to him. Fear can, can force you to conform, but only love will cause you to be devoted. And so God is showing them through this, this, this illustration of life that he does still love them, and he is the source of life. Later on, Moses would say in Deuteronomy, when he reads the law to the people, he said, look, I, I, I lay before you death and life. Please choose life. And that's really what is being done here. At this point, Look what Israel says, 17, verse 12. It's fascinating. The Israelites said to Moses, we will die. We are lost. We are all lost. Anyone who even comes near the tabernacle of the Lord will die. Well, I think this is when the truth finally breaks through. And they come to the final realization that just as God has said, they are doomed to wander and die in the desert. They will never see the promised land. They are truly lost. You know, until God breaks our resistance completely and we confess that we are truly lost, he can never lead us to the promised land. He can never lead us 
to life. Now, after this, although there was plenty of grumbling and complaining, uh, the power of resistance and the constituency for a return to Egypt is pretty much gone. The people were now resigned to their fate, and they were ready to submit to God's will and his leadership through Moses and Aaron. So consequently, they were ready to start wandering. You know, all of that, and we just talked about the crisis of authority, was on this slide. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now, this is where Moses is recounting the story, and he says, Then we turned back, and we set out toward the wilderness along the route to the Red Sea, as the Lord had directed me. For a long time, we made our way around the hill country of Seir, and then the Lord said to me, you have made your way around this hill country long enough, now turn north. Those two verses are all we know about the wandering in the wilderness for 38 years. There still will be two more, but, but for those 38, we don't know a thing about it, not anything. Uh, look at our chart here. You can see that um, in wandering through the hill country of Seir, First of all, Seir is, is mainly considered over here to the east, these, this very high range of mountains. And that was settled by the descendants of Esau and is called Edom, or the Edomites live there. But Seir, the region of Seir also, it, it tends to encompass the hill country down here in the Negev to the south. So I, I don't think they went into Seir. They're forbidden to do that. They went to Edom, but they did wander all through this area and they got as far south as Azion Geber, which is at the head of the Gulf of Aqaba. So they're down in here doing something. And finally, God says, all right, you've done enough. All right, head north. And that's what they do. Now, um, their life must have been much like the Bedouin that we know today. And uh, so they head back north. And when they head north, they go to Kadesh Barnea. And so they are back where they started at the camp in Kadesh. They may have hit that place more than once. We don't know. And the storyline picks up uh, in Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. Okay. In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin. Now, Zin is not the wilderness of Sin. They're two different places. Zin is up here in the northeast of, of Sinai. And uh, they stayed at Kadesh, and there Miriam died and was buried. There were no exceptions. Everybody 20 years old and older would be dead before they hit the promised land. And so that included Miriam. And you'll see a little bit later, it also included uh, Aaron. Now, it's the 38 year mark, they've returned there. And uh, at this point, I don't have time to go through it all, but this is where Moses disobeys God and he strikes the rock for water instead of speaking to it. And for that, and who knows what else, God forbid Moses from actually entering into the promised land when they crossed the Jordan with Joshua. So this begins the leg of, uh, of their journey where he has to take Israel past Edom and then around Moab and he defeats the Amorites in the Transjordan and comes back to the plains of Moab. Now let me give you those places just quickly from the map. They went from Kadesh Barnea and they went north, and the first place they stopped was Mount Hor, which we think is here. By the way, all these locations are approximate. Nobody knows for sure where a lot of them are. Uh, there's just the best scholarship comes up with one or two locations, and you try to fit them in there. This is a picture of Mount Hor up here, uh, where Aaron died, if that's the right one. In Numbers 20, verses 22 to 26, he says, the whole Israelite community set out from Kadesh and came to Mount Hor. At Mount Hor, near the border of Edom, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Aaron will be gathered to his people. He will not enter the land I gave the Israelites because both of you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. Get Aaron and his son, Eleazar, take them up Mount Hor, remove Aaron's garments and put them on his son, Eleazar, for Aaron will be gathered to his people. He will die there. There's another one. We don't know where his tomb is. We just know that he died in the mountain. There's a shrine up there right now, but um, nobody has an idea where he was buried. Same thing with Moses, as you know. Um, so Eleazar is now 
the, the high priest. And this con confirms that this priesthood is hereditary and it goes through the line of Aaron. Now, as they're on their way up here, okay, the kings of Aaron, now I want you to remember this, remember up on the central ridge, there were those Canaanite kings. Well, there was uh, a kingdom of, of Arad, which was one of those kings. That's right here where this little circle is. And he comes down to engage them in battle. He may have thought, well, we, we wax them once, we'll wax them again. And they go out to meet him and they destroy them totally. They, are, they, are, they destroyed all their cities, all their villages. They left no survivors. Hormah is where this took place. Remember Hormah? That is where going up without God's presence, they were destroyed themselves. And so this is sort of come up. This is, this is what goes around, comes around. And they ended up uh, destroying the kingdoms of Arad uh, right at the same place where the Israelites defeat, were defeated uh, back at the uh, Great Refusal. And I think it possibly was the same kings. Now, Moses' plan was apparently to invade from the east. He would come up here, and then he would cross over into Canaan proper. Uh, and I tell you, he would have preferred to, uh, to go down here. See this road down here and up the middle. This is called the King's Highway. And it is the most common trade route up and down uh, from Syria down to Egypt and Arabia, uh, with the exception of the Way of the Sea, which is this one over here. Well, you could go either by the sea or you could go on the highway. It was a well-established route. You'd consider it the interstate of its day, uh, but they were not able to do so. Uh, and, and this is interesting because God says, do not go into Edom, do not provoke Moab, and do not provoke Ammon. Let me give you just a couple of words on that, where that comes from. Edom, I think I mentioned it a little earlier, they are the descendants of Esau. You remember when Jacob met Esau up here around Shechem and, um, you know, they reconciled and then Esau went south and separated himself from Jacob and his descendants became the Edomites. And that's been a kingdom there for many, many years. Similarly, during the days of Abraham, when Lot was pulled out of Sodom, when it, God was about to destroy it, remember that? And then he saw the fire fall down on that whole valley and he ran up into the mountains with his two daughters. He only had two daughters. And they said, our line is dead. We have no way to, to produce descendants. Let's get dad drunk, and then we'll lay with him, and we can have children by him. So he had two sons by the incestuous relationship with his daughters, and they were Ammon and Moab. And their descendants were these two. Now, God gave them that land. Notice here, uh, verse 5. Um, I have given Esau, the hill country of Sarah, as his own. Moab, uh, verse uh, 9, 10, uh, he says, I have given Ar, that's the city on the Argon River, Arnon River, uh, to the descendants of Lot as a possession. Ammon, do not harass them or provoke them to war. I will not give you possession of any land belonging to them. I've given it as a possession to the descendants of Lot. God decides when a nation will rise up, where it will be, how long it will last. Paul makes this point in his speech um, in Acts 17, verse 26, in, in the Areopagus in Athens. And he says, God marked out the nation's appointed times in history and the bounds of their lands. And that's true. You know, we've, we've seen our republic here rocked to its foundation. And there's talk, well, will America survive? Will, will we split? Uh, you know, in irreconcilable nations, uh, will we be destroyed? Uh, there's all kinds of questions. And we need to remember that. It is God who gives a, an appointed time to a nation and an appointed place. And we will not leave this place until he has ordained that we should. If we want to preserve our country, we should beg him to preserve us and send us revival. That's verse 26 there at the bottom of the chart. Okay, so uh, we can see that God said, don't touch these nations because I've given them the land. And that's true. But there's another insight that I want to give you on this thing. Um, because Deuteronomy chapter 2, and I hope you're there, once again raises that old matter of the giants. Okay? And that gives us another insight into the reason for these restrictions. Now, let me give you a little background. 
the genetic strain of giant men after the flood, which with which Canaan was loaded from the time of Abraham and on. Um, what I think that is, is that's the DNA that is left over from the Nephilim of Genesis, chapter six, where wicked angelic beings combined their seed with that of humans and produced demigods or supernaturally powerful human beings. And this was, we, we talked about this in our series in Genesis. This is strategically part of this incredible war that Satan waged between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Satan's attempt was to prevent the arrival of the promised one who would destroy him. That's Genesis 3.15. So the angels that did this were confined to the abyss, and so that was never done again. And the demigods that they, they spawned, they died in the flood. But their leftover DNA from their descendants came into the post-flood world, I think, through Ham's wife and specifically through Ham's son, Canaan. And that is why Noah cursed Canaan, because he saw that the giants and those, that whole race of wicked, evil beings that he thought he had left behind had actually made it through. So God destroys, is, well, God is at war with this, this race of giants ever since the days of uh, Noah. And he destroys this remnant of their seed in several ways. The first would be, that, at least the one person we know of, was in Genesis 14 when um, there was this great war. Five kings came in to attack Sodom. And before they could attack Sodom, they had to attack the giant tribes that were protecting them up to the east of the Jordan River. And they, they list here that they defeated, didn't destroy, but defeated Rephaim, Zuzim, Emim, and Horim, and the Amorites. Now, if you say Zuzim, you can also say Zuzites, because Zuzim is plural. Okay, I am. Um, Rephaim, or Rephaites, is sort of a general term as well as a specific one, and that really refers to all the giants after the flood. So just to give you that um, idea of the etymology. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 2 tells us of their further destruction after the... Um, this war in up to the years of Moses and Joshua in the conquest of Canaan. Deuteronomy 2, 10 to 12. Let's take a look at that. Um, oh, 10 to 12, back here. Yeah. The Emites used to live there. Now we're talking about the Moabites in, in the land of Moab. The Emites used to live there, a people strong and numerous and as tall as the Anakites or the Anakim. Remember, Goliath was one of the sons of Anak, and he was a giant. Like the Anakites, they too were considered Rephites, but the Moabites called them Emites. Everybody had their own name for these guys. The Horites used to live in Seir, but the descendants of Esau drove them out. They destroyed the Horites from before them and settled in their place, just as Israel did in the land the Lord gave them for their position. So really, Moab has fought the Lord's battles and destroyed the giant races within their land, Edom had done the same thing with the Horites in their land. And so we find out is also true of Ammon. You look then at um, uh, 220 to 21. He's talking about Ammon's uh, land. He said that too was considered a land of the Rephaites who used to live there, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumites. Okay, we all have a different name. They were a people strong and numerous and as tall as the Anakites. And the Lord destroyed them from before the Ammonites who drove them out and settled in their place. The Lord had done the same for the descendants of Esau who lived in Seir when he destroyed the Horites. We already heard that. And they drove them out and have lived in their place to this day. And as for the Avites, which apparently is another race of these giants, who lived in villages as far as Gaza, the Kaftorites coming in from Kaftor destroyed them and settled in their place. There's a little irony here because Kaftor is Cyprus and the migration from Cyprus to the Levant, to Southern Israel is exactly how the Philistines got established. So the Philistines who were Israel's mortal enemy actually were used of God to destroy one of these giant races. And it's true that Edom, Moab, and Ammon were all mortal enemies of Israel at some point or another, but God used them nonetheless. And this may have been why he, um, he protected that land. So in, in this period in history, 
A lot of destruction has taken place, but there's still a sizable remnant of these Rephaim, these giant nations in Canaan and the Transjordan. So Moses now proceeds, and uh, we're not going to read all the passages of it, but uh, he proceeds around Moab by the desert road, comes down the Arnon Gorge. This is the Arnon River here. And then he proceeds up the King's Highway and he destroys the kingdom of Sihon, capital is Heshbon. And then he goes north all the way up to Gilead and at the Battle of Edre, and he destroys Og. And he is the last of, of that kingdom. And it's an interesting verse. Chapter three, verse one says, next we turned and went up along the road toward Bashan. Bashan is up here, see, right there. Uh, with his whole army, oh, uh, Og, king of Bashan, with his whole army, marched out to meet us in battle at Edre. And the Lord said, don't be afraid of him, for I've delivered him in your hands. Go down to verse um, 11. Og, the king of Bashan, was the last of the Rephaites, at least in his region. His bed was decorated with iron and was more than nine cubits long. That's 15 feet and four cubits wide. That's about six feet. And it's still in Rabbah of the Ammonites. So they took the guy's bed and they took it to the capital of Ammon and they put it in a museum. So these tribes in this area to the north on the east side of the Jordan were all giant tribes and they were called Amorites. Just don't get confused. Ammonites, children of Ammon, Lot's descendants. Amorites are giants and they are children of Canaan. This, I used to get confused at that, and I imagine I haven't helped you much, but we'll try. Okay, then after this campaign, of course, there's Joshua. He cleaned out much of uh, the western side of the Jordan. And then even 400 years later, in 2 Samuel 21, we're told that David was still cleaning up the remnants of the Anakim, Goliath's family. Okay, now these were big battles. These are not small campaigns. Look at chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. Okay, and it says, so the Lord our God also gave into our hands Og, king of Bashan, and all his army. We struck them down, leaving no survivors. At that time, we took all his cities. There was not one of the 60 cities that we did not take from him. 60 cities. The whole region of Argob, Og's kingdom in Bashan. All these cities were fortified with high walls, with gates and bars, and there were also a great many unwalled villages. We don't know how many of those. We completely destroyed them as we had done with Sihon, king of Heshbon destroying every city, men, women, and children. This is pretty severe. This is God's war against that great uh, evil that took place when Satan tried to contaminate the human uh, gene pool with wicked angels and uh, produce these giants. Uh, now the battle of the seeds goes on. We, we don't hear of Nephilim and Rephaim much anymore. Hopefully they're gone forever. Um, Satan's strategy would continue for another 1,400 years. And, you know, part of that was the destruction of the baby boys in Bethlehem at Christmas. And, um, and of course, it culminated in the crucifixion of the Savior, which Satan may have felt would have been a great victory. But in, terms, in, in turn, ironically, it was the very means of his demise. And that's why Jesus could, from the cross, he could yell, Tetelestai, it is finished. This battle that has raged since Genesis 3.15, when he promised a redeemer that would crush the head of Satan, and Satan did everything he could to pollute the, the gene pool, to destroy the humankind, to destroy any source of this promised Messiah, finally has culminated in the victory that's, that Jesus won over Satan. That's why we say he's a defeated foe. And that's why the church age that we're living in is really an age of mopping up. This is an age where Satan is doing everything he can to, uh, to bring as many down with him, but he's going down and he knows it. So at the end of this period, they ended up right here at the plains of Moab. We got a picture of that. There it is. These are the plains of Moab. Now I'm looking from the east, from Canaan over here, I'm looking that way to the east. And, um, and there's Mount Nebo. Mount Pisgah is part of that range, so is Baal, Peor. But uh, these, these, this, these fields here, this is where they camped. It must have been a giant camp. And it was right opposite the Jordan River from Jericho, which is just below this picture. Okay? Now, Re Reuben and Gad, those two tribes, were particularly fond of the pasture land to the east. 
And, uh, and so they said, we really want to stay here. We'll be glad to take this. This will be our promised land. And uh, it was a big conflict because all the rest of the tribes are saying, oh, I get it. We're going to go ahead. We're going to go ahead and keep, you know, can, uh, defeat these areas. We're going to conquer them. And then you're going to take them while we go off and have to go conquer the rest. And um, so they struck a deal. You can read about that in Genesis 3, 18 to 20. They were basically given some time so they could garrison a few of the towns that they had destroyed, leave their families and their livestock while they crossed the Jordan. And they fought with the rest of Israel under Joshua until those campaigns were complete and they could return to their homes. Now, all these things were settled right down here in the plains of Moab, right out in this region. Now, there's a number of events that take there, but the, the biggest one is the affair of Balaam, the prophet for hire. Now, you've probably heard of Balaam's ass, the, the donkey that talks to him. I mean, that's part of this story, but it's a far bigger story than that. And uh, it actually occupies four chapters in the book of Numbers. So that's a pretty important story. And we don't have time to go into the details. I would just urge you to read the whole story from beginning to end. But um, basically, Balaam was called upon by a, uh, uh, an alliance of Midianites and Moabites to curse Israel by looking down from these mountains here over that plain. And God would not let him do so. Instead, he blessed Israel. And then... We don't know this until we read in Revelation, uh, uh, read about it in Revelation, I think it is, um, that he counseled the king of Moab, if you're going to defeat these people, you must seduce them. And so they used temple prostitutes from one of the Baal religions called Baal of Peor to go into the camp and solicit men to join them enough in eating food offered to idols and then in going to Baal Peor and, and the, the rituals of Baal worship were highly sexual. And so they were very, very attracted to males, obviously. Uh, and they were uh, sacred prostitution and materialism was what they were all about. And that introduced into Israel a plague that would plague them for the rest of their existence up until uh, they were carried off into Babylon. It seemed that the captivity at least cured them from formal Baal worship. But up until that time, they were um, seduced into this uh, prostitution and materialism. It's, it's basically drugs, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, or you might say, uh, you know, pleasure and, uh, and prosperity. And that's really what this was all about. And the interesting thing is that uh, this doctrine is with us even to the last days in the church. There is a verse in Revelation, one of the letters to the church is Revelation 2, 14, and it says, I have a few things against you. He's talking to a church in Pergamum, and he says, there are among you some who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin, so they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Still with us. Still with us. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, pleasure. Prosperity, those are the two things that mark our age, I think. And we need to be careful of them because they are a deadly uh, formula that God can use to seduce us away from the worship of the one true God. So um, it was here that God told Moses, you get to this point, Moses, you're at the end of the road. Verse, uh, chapter 34, verses 1 through 7. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo. It's right over here, right up in here, okay? From the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah, across from Jericho. And there the Lord showed him the whole land from Gilead to Dan, all of Naphtali, the territory of Ephraim, Manasseh, the land of Judah as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev and the whole region from the Valley of Jericho, the city of Palms, as far as Zor. And then the Lord said to him, this is the land. I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I've let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over it. Let me stop there for a second. <laughs> what would it be like to be up on this mountain looking over that vista? And God himself saying, there it is. This is what you did everything you did to realize. This is why I brought you here. That must have been a phenomenal moment. Then it says, And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. 
He buried him in Moab in the valley opposite Beth Peor. But to this day, nobody knows where his grave is. Moses is 120 years old when he died. Yet his eyes were not weak or his strength gone. There are a few people who've made it to 120, but I doubt that there are many who could climb to the top of Mount Nebo and with, with a strong eye and a strong body. You know, my own mother is 96 years old, and I sometimes ask her, and I try to imagine how the world has changed since she was a little girl. And for that matter, uh, I'm sure my grandkids are asking the same question of me. Uh, we're getting up there now, but um, I want you to imagine for a minute the world, how it's changed in Moses' lifetime. And as he looked back over those 120 years, what, what he could remember. I mean, from his youth, he's, he's thinking of the dazzling courts of Egypt and all the years, 40 years he spent, prominence of the royal family, leading the armies in battle, successful and an apparent heir to the throne. Uh, and then the sudden fall from favor and his flight to Midian, and 40 years wandering around in a wilderness. Does that sound familiar? With a bunch of sheep following him. And then it was returned to Egypt where he lost his family. And um, Zipporah left him with her children. And the conflict with Pharaoh, the plagues, and all that turmoil, and that incredible night with the Passover where the angel of death came, and they were thrown out of, the, of the Egypt. And then all the hardship and the cares leading a million plus people through the desert rocks and sand and, and dirt and up to the Red Sea and the terror they must have felt. You remember, he'll, he'll look back on that, on that Nueva beach where they were stuck and the army comes and it's going to slaughter them all and they're terrified. And then this great deliverance through the Red Sea uh, and then the exhilaration of seeing the Red Sea collapse and destroy the Egyptian army and know that they would never, ever see them again. Wow. And the year at Sinai, the great assembly, all oh, the fire, the clouds, the smoke, the thunder, the lightning, uh, the, 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 the voice from the mountain, the, 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 the great uh, giving of the law, the, the, the time that he came down with the tablets and he broke them because the people had broke the covenant, the, the calf rebellion. And, and I'm sure he remembers the close communion he had with God during those times he spent on the mountain, the 40 days, three times without food and water that he spent. And then, of course, the trip to Kadesh and all that, the coup, the, the great refusal, the, the, the refusal to, to go into the land, and then the, the chaos that took place and, and the fact that his authority was, was challenged and his enemies swallowed whole into the earth. And, oh, my goodness, all that that goes, the violence of it all. And then um, 40 more years wandering in that wilderness. You know, he'd done that once with sheep. Now he's doing it with a million people. And then all those first three conquests of, mortal, of the mortal enemies of God, the giants, and the beginning of the settlement of the promised land with Reuben, Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh. And then his final meeting with the Lord on top of this mountain. And God shows him the whole thing. He said, this is the land. I don't know what it looked like back then. I, I have a feeling that there was much more green than there is today. They were much closer to the flood. The climate was different. We know, for example, the Sahara Desert back in the early days was filled with swamps and, and had a lot of water. So maybe that was true here. Uh, in Abraham's day, uh, Sodom and the, and the whole valley of the Dead Sea was rich and green. And Lot chose that. So it was different. And uh, it must have been a beautiful picture. They had this final meeting and God shows us all this and then he just goes home with his God. What a life. Look back on your life and you see what God has done. Well, there's a final tribute to Moses that's given. There are wonderful words. Chapter 34, verses 10 to 12. says, Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and all his officials, and to the whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. I mean, he could look back on his life and he could say with Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 
Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but to all those who have longed for his appearing. We may not do the mighty acts of God. We might not see what Moses saw, but we do have a legacy. And the legacy of these things, let me just give it to you real quickly. First of all, he gave us the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments. No greater or more concentrated description of the righteousness so necessary to our happy existence has ever been written down. And we've thrown it out of our schools to our own peril, and we're fools for doing so. But he did give us the Ten Commandments. He gave us the first five books of the Bible, what we know as the Pentateuch. He collected all the records from the days before the flood, and he compiled them into this great book of Genesis, and then he gave us this accurate authority, authoritative rather book about the mighty deeds, the mightiest deeds that have ever really been done on the earth uh, among men. And then, of course, he gave us the nation of Israel. He took a bunch of slaves and he converted them under God to this wonderful, uh, amazing nation that persists to this day like no other nation. Israel's given the word of God to us. It's preserved the word of God for us. It has given us the savior of this world, and it is also through them that all this world has been blessed. We are fools if we do not recognize that and bless Israel that we too might be blessed of God. And then I think he is the best example of leadership the world has ever seen. He first loved and followed the Lord his God unwaveringly and without regard for what anybody else said or any danger to himself. And then he loved and served his people even when they repaid him with rebellion and hatred. You see again and again and again, the people are turning away. The whole thing's turning to, to, to chaos. And he, God says, I'm going to destroy them all. And where's Moses? He's on his face pleading for his people. He cares for the people that he leads. He loves them. And he is an intercessor with them. And he just, he just demonstrated incredible toughness. And yet number says he was the most humble man in the world. Surely he has fought the good fight. He's finished the race. He can look back on his life and see that he did leave us a great legacy and been a great example. Now I can look back on my life. What do I see? What do you see? Can you say, I have fought a good fight? I have finished the race. Now, look, Moses was not perfect. He made enough mistakes to be barred from going into the promised land. But look, now there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, not only to me, all those who love's appearing. How about you? you? Love is appearing? May he award us that crown of righteousness on that day. What a life. What a life to study.